Hey, Carrie, we have the uh, stream going if you want to send a test message over. Okay, I'll send that now. Just give me one moment. Sure thing. Okay, I sent a test message, so you should see it in, a, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance. Officer Reindell is going to lead us. Thank you. Good evening. The uh, month of October is recognized as National Principals Month. And as we typically start board meetings, we like to do that with recognitions. I think there's no other way to do that. And we have a special, a couple special groups here today that we want to recognize. It's a time for us to celebrate the hard work and dedication of our principals. We're honored to have with us representatives from our team of 65 principals. So would the following principals please come forward. Tyson Ostrowski, Blue Valley North. Scott Bacon, Blue Valley High. Diana Tate, Aubrey Ben Middle. Stacy Sperry, Prairie Star Elementary. Laura LaHue, Cedar Hills Elementary. Deborah Kelly, Blue River Elementary. Kendall Burr, Hilltop Early Childhood. All right. So again, we couldn't fit every principal here. So this is a group that's really just representing their um, colleagues. So thank you for being here. Um, you know, student learning, safety, and school cult culture are among the key responsibilities of our principals. And no matter the challenges, our school administrators have been there leading the way for our students and our staff and families. They work hand in hand um, with our families and, and their staffs to create caring and inclusive environments where students want to learn. And I think we could, uh, We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about what a difficult time it's been lately, and especially their day-to-day -day work. And I know, Dr. Merrigan, you wanted to talk a little bit about what it's really like for them every day when they come to work. So I haven't been a school principal um, actually in the building for over 10 years. But just with all of the things that are happening this year, let, let's think about what a, a principal's day looks like. So first of all, they meet buses. Um, so buses are late because we've had a shortage of drivers. And so they're working uh, to make sure kids are, are okay when they get there. And they say, it's okay if you're late, you just go to class. Um, they're notifying families if it's late going home. Um, but even maybe before they're m meeting buses, they're working on subs. And subs have been another uh, shortage this year. So they're frantically trying to figure out um, if they don't have a sub for a classroom, how are they going to cover that? Then there, we've been working really hard to get paraprofessionals in our building. And so they're short those in some buildings so or in some classrooms. So they're scrambling, trying to make sure every student's um, needs are met. Uh, they're working with teachers, uh, working with PLCs, with our great teachers, making sure um, that they have what they need. Um, they're talking to students who are struggling or um, maybe who had a little bit of a challenge and they're trying to reset them. And that goes on throughout the day. So there are just so many challenges. And this representative group, every single one of our building administrators are absolute rock stars. And we could not function within our buildings without them. And I'm so proud uh, that we are recognizing them this month. And we should be recognizing them every single day. Um, but they're amazing. And we thank you for all that you guys do every day. Congratulations and thank you. Casey's going to take a quick pick. All right, thanks for all you do. <laughs> so Dr. Men Dr. Merrigan mentioned that uh, they were a bunch of rock stars and they are not the only rock stars in the house tonight. Um, this week we also uh, want to recognize um, National School Lunch Week and we're happy to be joined by several of Blue Valley's food and nutrition and services staff in the schools. And again, they are here also representing a very large job group because it takes so many for our students to be fed. So would, please, would you please come forward, Kathy Dietz 
Blue Valley North High Manager, George Johnson, Oxford Middle School Manager, Ellie Para, Overland Trail Elementary Manager, Joanne Blakely, Supervisor, Leslie Belt, Supervisor, and Charles Rathbun, the Director. So these people, yes, thank you. These people, along with our entire food service staff across the district, are truly unsung heroes. You know, they help guarantee Blue Valley students have nutritious meals and are ready to learn. This week, we honor the commitment and dedication of our food service staff who have gone above and beyond to continue providing meals to students despite many challenges. Your love and dedication for what you do and those you serve here in Blue Valley are noteworthy and absolutely extraordinary. Dr. Merrigan. So this is another group of unsung heroes. Um, we have not been uh, fully staffed in our food service programs either this year. And so ma many of these people have had to jump in at various stages. I'm sure our supervisors, our managers have had to do uh, go above and beyond to make sure that kids are fed every day. So I don't know if any of you have gone out to a restaurant lately, but if you have, you'll notice on the door that the hours are reduced or they'll make sure they tell you they have limited quantities and, and we can't do that. We can't say, we're just going to serve from 11 to 12 today, and uh, you, you can't come through. We have to serve our normal meals. Um, they have uh, continued to provide high-quality, nutritious meals for our kids, um, and they truly are unsung heroes. And Charles, as the director, we want to thank you for all that you do. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about this group. You know, this is an awesome week. You know, we've gone through a lot over the last 19 months. But before that, this team that represents just a small group of our team have always done an awesome job the last 19 months. I can't thank you enough for all you guys have done. It's uh, unbelievable, actually. So thank you. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> now Casey's going to take a picture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have um, a couple more recognitions, and I just wanted to let um, folks know that there's usually an opportunity after recognitions are done where if you'd like to escape and watch whatever's on Monday Night TV, <laughs> you're welcome to do so, or we would also invite you to stay um, for the rest of the board meeting. But I didn't want it to be awkward for you as you're thinking, how can I slip out of here? Um, our next two um, people being recognized, it's for the Distinguished Service and Excellence in Education Award. Um, and these are awards that we do every month, and these special people go above and beyond each day in our school. So first up, would Regina Alberton please come forward with Matt Brooks? Regina Alberton. We're excited to recognize Regina, one of our custodians, with a Distinguished Service Award. Regina has been with the district for 27 and a half years. That's amazing. <laughs> Matt, you know uh, very well how our custodians play an important role in creating a safe and clean and functional environment for our teachers and students. So tell us a little bit about Regina. Yes, well, as you can hear, she's been here 27 and a half years. And I'm sure maybe some of the principals sitting in here have had the opportunity to have her come through your school. You know, when I got here a little over 11 years ago, um, she was the day custodian at Valley, not Oak Valley Hill. Park, Oak Hill. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> Oak Hill Elementary School, you know, doing a wonderful job there, taking care of the kids during the day. And, you know, then she has a change of life and she's like, well, I'd like to go evenings. So then Blue Valley North was blessed with her cleaning skills uh, on evenings. And, you know, Regina's done a number of other things for us behind the scenes. And, you know, for 27 and a half years, um, I'm sure she's done more behind the scenes stuff. But uh, in the summertime, she's helped us lead uh, summertime crews that like to work the evening hours. 
Uh, some people like to stay on their regular schedule, work five days a week, as opposed to go to four tens in the summertime. And Regina has been one of those troopers who likes to do that and has helped us clean a number of buildings throughout the district uh, in the summertime. So Regina, you know, just highly appreciate your 27 and a half years. And obviously we're looking forward to more. And is there anything you'd like to say? Just thank you, and yeah, I just try and do my best, and I want to make everybody's buildings look good, so <laughs> that's just always been my thing, just try and treat everybody, you know, as if they were family, you know. So, thank you. Appreciate it. So, Regina, uh, custodians is another area where we haven't been fully staffed, and <laughs> you all have had to do lots uh, yeah. with fewer people, and so... Um, Thank you for all that you do because you are an integral part of our buildings. Um, you help to make Blue Valley North function and uh, being in a big high school like that, it, it takes all of us. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. you know, I know you also have family here and I know you can't do what you do without your family. So would you wave if you're part of our family? There we go. We're gonna get a picture. All right, congratulations. Okay, for our final recognition, would um, Lori Farrington please come forward with your principal, Stacy Sperry. We are excited to recognize Lori Farrington, special education teacher at Prairie Star Elementary with an Excellence in Education Award. This year is Lori's 17th year in the district and we're proud that our special education educators continue to create an atmosphere where their students can lead healthy, balanced lives of physical, social, and emotional well-being. Stacy, please tell us why she's so deserving of this award. There are so many words that I could share about Lori. Um, she's tremendous in all ways. Um, I think one of the most uh, wonderful attributes about Lori is that she sees the best in kids and then makes them believe those things about themselves. Um, she's a calm, fierce advocate. Um, and she's just, she makes you a better educator and person. So to know her is to love her, and she is truly amazing at what she does. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what to say. <laughs> thank you so much, and um, thank you to my family who is watching from home, but also a shout-out to the PSE family who, you know, everything we do is a team effort. So um, I really appreciate it, and I'm not going to cry. Thank you. <laughs> Lori, um, you know, it's very fitting that we have a special ed educator up here because your job is a challenge. Every teacher's job is challenging, but every single day you work to really help our most vulnerable students to make sure that they feel successful and loved and appreciated and, and do well at school. So thank you for all that you do. Um, we're very proud of you and very glad that we could make this recognition today. Thank you. All right. We're going to take a picture. <laughs> All right, Blue Valley's known for having some of the very best of the best staff members, and thank you for those that we were able to recognize tonight. Congratulations, and thank you to everyone. This will be the opportunity, if you wanted to sneak out, to do so. And uh, those that are staying might be able to find a better seat and spread out a little.
All right, we are gonna move on and have our open forum part of the evening. Um, I wanna say welcome to those who are in attendance to address the board or listen, to the, listen during open forum. Open forum provides a time for individuals to address the board in an effort to ensure an orderly, efficient, effective, and dignified meeting. Open forum will be provided for up to 60 minutes in an effort to give as many individuals an opportunity to speak as possible during the 60 minute open forum. The board will um, enforce a three minute limit per speaker. After the 60 minutes, the board will close open forum and will proceed with its agenda items for the evening. Whether you plan to speak or just listen, we're glad you're here because we do care about the opinions and concerns of our patrons. If you do not have an opportunity to address the board during the meeting, you may address the board by email communication. I have a few reminders about open forum that will help our speakers to have a constructive and positive experience when discussing items with the board. When making remarks, please be civil and use respectful language. Please limit discussion to relevant business of the board tonight. Discussion of matters related to a specific student or employee is not allowed. Instead, comments should be submitted in writing to the superintendent. Please remember to limit your comments to three minutes and avoid repeating the concerns of a previous speaker. If you have a question that requires a response, someone will follow up with you at a later time. On behalf of the board, I welcome you and appreciate your interest in Blue Valley as we strive to provide the best education possible for our students. When your name is called, please introduce yourself be before beginning your remarks. As a reminder, we ask that all remarks are limited to three minutes. And we will get started with Melissa Jenner. Good evening, Dr. Merrigan and members of the board. My name is Melissa Jenner. Um, I'm an area physician and I'm here today as a private citizen. Um, I'm just here again to thank you for keeping our kids safely in school. Um, Blue Valley schools have continued to show that we have the right formula and solutions to keep our kids safely in person. Um, in the last month, we've had five homecoming dances, um, many, many football games, band concerts, and many other events. And we've not had one large outbreak um, in that time or even since the eight weeks that school has started. And that's an absolute testament to the mitigation strategies that you've chosen to implement in our schools. Um, our kids are, again, thriving personally. My, my daughter has been able to go to her first homecoming dance, um, her first tailgate party, um, and her first high, high school football game. Things that I didn't think she was at all interested in, but man, was she ready to go, and she had a great time. Um, so um, I also know that you know we've implement we've listened to our patrons and our families and they've implemented uh, testing um, through the schools um, so that you're able to go and get test results quickly if you are sick or if your family is sick. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. I know personally uh, we had a sniffle a couple weeks ago and it took us. Uh, several days to get test results back and I'm so glad that now we have that opportunity to have them quickly here um, through the partnership with Blue Valley Schools. so I really appreciate that. Um, I also know that you guys will be in, uh, talking today a little bit about the uh, test to stay or to learn learn and test or I don't know the exact words but but that's a great program as well and I'm interested to hear more about that. Um, so again um, I hope that our vaccination rates will continue to rise and that our numbers will continue to stay low if we stay this course. Um, we have to remember to stay vigilant. Um, if you look at the dashboard, our case transmission remains high throughout the community. Um, but really, as a physician, I, I'm finally really beginning to see that small light at the end of the tunnel, um, and that makes me that makes me hopeful. Um, and so I just want to make sure that you all know how, how thankful I am that my kids are able to be, and all the kids are able to be uh, safely in the schools and are remaining healthy throughout the school year. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next is Sloan Heller. Oh. Um, Wendy Connolly. Hi, I'm Wendy Connolly, and first I just want to say I am delighted to see for the first time an audience completely filled with masks on. Um, I am going to remove mine, and I'm not here to speak about masks tonight, actually. I'm here tonight because I want to thank Blue Valley Schools for repeatedly proving me wrong. I am the proud parent of a transgender student. After a move that took us away from our feeder schools, 
a year of virtual learning, and with two Pfizer jabs in their arm, I sent my courageous, colorful, and wildly creative teenager off to their sophomore year at Blue Valley Southwest. And to be honest, I was afraid of how the world of high school might treat them, and that for them, this could be a truly soul-crushing experience. I was afraid the transition to school would be difficult to navigate for an LGBT youth, but Blue Valley proved me wrong. Our incredible guidance counselor, Ms. Dixon, set up a meeting to talk through concerns and questions and made it ferociously clear that she would have my kids back. I was afraid that my teen would be bullied by peers and struggle to fit in, but Blue Valley proved me wrong. Not a single student this year has ridiculed, teased, or bullied them. And within the first two days of school, they had friends in every single class. I was afraid that teachers might slowly chip away at their identity, dismiss their reality, or shame them. But Blue Valley schools proved me wrong. Every single teacher asked about pronouns and pulled my kid aside to let them know that they were safe, supportive, and trustworthy allies. Over and over again this year, Blue Valley has met my fears for my kids' safety, mental health, and fundamental need for belonging with reassurances that transgendered and other LGBTQ youth are beloved members of the Blue Valley community. So thank you, Blue Valley, Blue Valley Southwest High School, for welcoming my teen exactly as they were created by God in all her infinite and ineffable wisdom. And thank you, Blue Valley leaders, for setting a tone that moves beyond mere tolerance, because none of us like to just be tolerated, uh, to one of being truly accepted with unconditional love. Thank you again for proving me wrong. Thank you. That was amazing. I'm like a little emotional right now, so thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Jeff Nessel. Hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. My name is Jeff Nessel, and I have a son at Blue Valley North. I want to take this time again to thank the board, the six members of the board, I should say, who use science and data to approve the BAS requirement for Blue Valley schools. The six of you not only showed intelligence and courage, but your actions have kept my son and who knows how many others in school uninterrupted this semester. I was hoping to make this statement short and light with one shout out maybe to the board and perhaps a story about my sons and my trip to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame earlier this month. How is it that ABBA is in there, but not Warren Zevon and Mata Hoople. I, I don't understand that, but this is not the time for that discussion. I was also going to use this time to compliment the people on the other side of the mask and vaccination debate who continue to passionately argue their case, even though they have no reputable scientific facts or data to support their argument. It is if it weren't so dangerous, you would have to admire their anti-science aggression, combining with their lack of knowledge and facts to fuel their political argument. Kudos to them, though. Unfortunately, my feel-good nature for this statement was shattered by an email I received from a mother of a transgender child. This mother referenced the comments of an anti-mask candidate for a seat on this board who would talk about a mother talking about her transgender child at a town hall was guilty of, quote, child abuse. And that, this is also another exact quote from this person, there are no eight-year-old transgender kids. The stupidity of that statement is only matched by its underlying cruelty and hatred. I have had numerous discussions with this candidate on his Facebook page, and although we disagree on almost every issue facing the district, I applaud his willingness to engage with voters, which unfortunately other people on his slate refuse to do. However, his comments regarding transgender youth students and their parents being abusers, along with his insistence that the Board of Education, your board, is banning books, which is, can't be true because it's still available in the library, is very disappointing. Such asinine and incorrect comments said specifically to appeal to a certain constituency can only drive a bigger wedge in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Mindy Maines.
Thank you. My name is Mindy Maines, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, like several before me, I wanted to really tell you how much I appreciate you enforcing your mask mandates at school also, not only for all the kids, but also for the teachers who have dedicated their lives to them, and also for all of our healthcare workers who have worked beyond their capabilities and, and strength just because they are, they're so dedicated to what they do. Um, I also wanted to support all your efforts to teach accurate history. Um, I went to schools throughout the United States growing up, and I can say that pretty much every textbook in every state did a great job of talking about how great our country is, which it truly is. Um, we didn't do as well about owning mistakes we've made. Uh, I'm a restorative justice specialist uh, working at a different school district, and I'd have to say the magic occurs when I see high school students who are trying to make excuses for their own bad behavior. The place where suddenly all those walls come down is when an adult says, you know, I really made a mistake and I want to apologize to you, whether it's a teacher, an administrator, a parent. It is suddenly, it is magical for that student to get to hear an adult say we made a mistake and here's what we want to do to help rectify that. I think when we're teaching history, we got to have that same moment. And one thing I'm interested in knowing is I'd like to see what kind of textbooks we currently have and what your plans are going forward, what state you're getting them from, as some states definitely have a more accurate portrayal of history than others. So that is something that I would like to get information back on. And I really applaud all your efforts to um, make that as strong and honest a curriculum as is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Corinne Geisler. Geisler? Sorry. No, it's okay. Is that Corinne right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, say it for me correctly. Corinne Geisler. Geisler. So my second one was. Yes, yes. Hi, my name is Corinne Geisler. Um, and the first thing I would like to do is I would like to thank Wendy for uh, your statement, and it's just very moving, and, and it makes me very happy to be a Blue Valley parent. Um, I am the parent of two students at Cottonwood Point Elementary School, and I just wanted to take a few minutes of your time to thank the board, the district administrators, teachers, and staff for all of your hard work in this less than ideal year. Uh, I would like to thank other parents in the district. Nothing about the past two years has been easy, but we are getting through it together. My kids so far this year, they come home excited every single day to tell me about what they did and what they learned. Their teachers are doing an amazing job building those connections that make learning easy. At the beginning of the year, every now and then I would check in with them. I would ask, hey, how's everybody doing with the masks in class? And I finally had to stop asking when my fourth grader just sighed and rolled her eyes and said, mom, we've been doing this for almost two years. We're used to it, it's fine. Things are different, but that doesn't mean they have to be worse. My husband and I had a great time sitting out on our porch the other night, listening to Blue Valley Northwest High School homecoming. They had their dance outside in front of the courtyard and we could hear the cheering and the singing all the way across Antioch, or all the way across Schweitzer at our house. You know it was a good time and it was a unique memory that the students, the teachers, and other staff members put a lot of creativity and thought in to create for those students. This hard work is paying off. Our district's COVID numbers continue to decline. It's a relief to all parents, and I know our greater community. I'm here this evening to ask that we don't take our foot off the gas now. I understand that we all want our lives to get back to whatever we think normal was for us, but just because our numbers are good right now, it's because we have the mitigation strategies in place. Vaccinations for younger kids are around the corner. Let's please keep doing what we know works, what we've proven works, and we can get there together. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Next is David Jarrell. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Jarrell, and I'm a resident of Leewood. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Merrigan and members of the board for having all of us here. It's truly an honor to hear all the recognitions and the stories. So um, I'm the father of a student at Blue Valley High, along with two uh, other graduates from Blue Valley High School. Um, we also have a fourth child who will be at Blue Valley High School in a few years. Um, but tonight, I'm here to express my sincere appreciation for the recent and still ongoing building improvements at Blue Valley High School. Thanks to the 2020 bond, which the school board uh, proposed to resident patrons, in which we patrons voted overwhelmingly to, improve, to approve, our high school facilities got much needed and overdue updates with student learning and safety in mind. We have more classrooms. We have awesome, flexible learning spaces, uh, particularly at the various schools throughout the district. We have new facilities for sports, performing arts, and activities. And we also have um, important security upgrades that are being made to the schools. So to everyone who made the 2020 bond a reality, a sincere thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts. We're honored to be part of this learning and parent community. You saw it here tonight. And I'm speaking not just for Blue Valley High School, but for schools throughout the district. I'm very grateful that our school facilities will be much better equipped for all of our students in the years to come. So thank you again to our school board and our learning community. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, next is Sylvia Williams. No, sorry, you told me. Um, next is Rhoda Amen. Uh, hello, my name is Rhoda. I'm a senior at Blue Valley North, just one of the few representatives of North today. Blue Valley North was named the number one high school in the state of Kansas this year. Now you might be wondering, what is she gonna talk about? It's literally the best high school in the state. Although the title sounds great, like many other schools nationwide, North needs some improvements, starting off with our library. In the past two years, both of North's, li North's library paras were terminated along with their positions. Library paras are a backbone to the library as they help run the library while the, t while the, li while the librarians teach. The library staff members are what keep those students going. Earlier this year, my grandmother passed away. While I kept a big smile on my face to disguise my pain, the only person who saw through it was Miss Cornelius, a Blue Valley North librarian who was watching tonight on the live stream. While she's a librarian and wasn't one of those terminated, we lost a few greats. The district had promised that the termination of the positions was purely for financial reasons and that they would have no effects on the students. There were, in fact, effects on the students. The hours of the library were 6.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. and are now 7.30 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. Middle schools have lost all of their paras over the last two years, leaving only the librarian. With just a librarian, they must close and lock the library when they go use the restroom, something that was not a problem just two years ago. At North, the library was used as a safe resource for students after school to do their homework, get tutored by upperclassmen, and to simply wait for their parents. Daily students are being forced to wait until 4 o'clock due to the bus driver shortage. The library would have been a great resource for those students. Instead, they have to wait outside or in other parts of the school with zero staff supervision. There is a problem that, would, that is a problem that would have been solved had the library staff remained the same. Another effect is that there is an increase in stolen items in the library. With staff being cut short and sometimes having only one librarian run the whole place, it's easy for students to take things from the library without being seen. The loss of items in the library only adds to the financial strain of the district. The district should find other means of saving money than terminating some of the lowest paid staff members. Now, I'm not here to be tone deaf. I recognize that there is a fiscal shortage in the district and decisions made by the board are not taken lightly. But to take away some of the most important people in a school for students is not the best choice. The librarian staff are built-in therapists. They'll give you a great book recommendation and that book might change your life. And most of all, they are some of the kindest people with a fountain of advice ready to flow. Although I do not stand before you tonight with a tight solution, I implore, you I implore you to figure out ways to keep one of the best student resources. My solution is to, keep this, uh, to explore the surplus of managers. Other districts in the, in the area with far larger amounts of students would have fewer managers in Blue Valley. If Blue Valley employ, employs a similar student manager ratio as a Shawnee mission, Blue Valley would be saving millions of dollars that could go to things like libraries and increasing other resources for students. The termination of library paras only saved the district a couple hundred thousand, a small number compared to the amount the district could save. A library is a basis of knowledge and at no point should it be closed during the day and students should have access to it before and after school. 
In, in a time where students are struggling academically and emotionally, emotionally, the library is the one resource that addresses both for every student. Thank you, Rhoda. <laughs> Next is Cindy Holscher. Okay. Um, Sally Jersha. Marilyn Poskin. Hi, good evening. I'm Mary Lynn Poskin, and I'm here to express gratitude. Um, extraordinary gratitude for our outstanding public schools and for the Blue Valley District in particular. And I'm going to do, do so from three different roles that I hold. One is as a state legislator, Slater. I represent House District 20. And I can tell you that world-class public schools are the foundation for so many measurements that we use across the state for our success. And as we have noted before, the last couple of years have been very difficult. And I will tell you that as a legislator, I'm so grateful that with the foundation that we have of our outstanding public schools, we have been able to have record capital investment in 2020 in our state. And that is because our employers and various uh, businesses recognize the value of our outstanding public schools. So we broke the record for capital investment in the state of Kansas in 2020. As well, in 2021, we just broke into the top 20 states to do business in for the first time in history. So thank you from my role as a legislator for the outstanding work that you do at Blue Valley Public Schools. The second role that I'm going to speak about is my role as a higher education professional for over 20 years. And I currently have a small business advising college uh, admissions, advising our students in college admissions. And I will tell you that I'm extraordinarily grateful that Blue Valley School District graduates 70% or more of their students who are eligible for merit scholarships at the University of Kansas. That makes my job really easy because, you know, as college admissions advisors, we advise students to, you know, have various levels of selectivity that they're looking at in their plan. So it's wonderful that most of my clients already know that they qualify for a merit scholarship at the University of Kansas as well. There's this little piece of paper um, called the high school profile, and a lot of people aren't really aware of what this is and what it does, but the registrars at our high schools, when our students apply to college, they send these out with the transcripts. Now, a lot of the students that I work with are looking at very selective colleges, and I will tell you that most people in those admissions offices understand the value of a Blue Valley education, and this is the proof. And for the schools that are maybe outside of that normal range of the high selectivity, they read this and they know that they can take our students and that they will benefit greatly from their college education. And last but not least, and I only left myself 32 seconds for this as a patron, uh, my blended family has uh, seven children. We have 90 years of K through 12 education experience, 62 of which are right here in Johnson County. So I would like to thank the librarians who fired their imagination, the administrations, if you were fast at math and you saw that we should have 91 years, one of my children skipped a grade. The administrators made that outstanding. I have a child who had an IEP for severe apraxia of speech. He went on to get an engineering degree from Dartmouth and swam in the college level. Our specials teacher, including Sue Thacker at Harmony Elementary, is the one common denominator of all seven of my children. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Fariha Shafi. Okay. Edwin Jenner. He didn't have a center, so he couldn't come. Okay. Um, Greg Williams. Uh, Greg Williams, a uh, patron of Blue Valley, a parent of a Prairie Star fifth grader, and I really have nothing to add to what everybody else said. I just want to thank the seven board members for volunteering to serve. We really appreciate you serving as a volunteer on this board. It's very important that you do, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Holly Skelton. Hi, my name is Holly Skelton, and I'm a clinical pharmacist, but I'm also the mother of three children. Um, my oldest goes to elementary school in uh, Blue Valley, and my younger two will be at that same elementary school shortly. Um, but I had three main things I wanted to talk about tonight. Number one, thank you. Um, thank you to you guys. Thank you to the administrators, principals, teachers, support staff, paraprofessionals, custodial services, transportation services, and anyone else I probably forgot. 
um, for making this entire um, season work and short staffed, no less, um, to make sure that our children are, are their academic, emotional, health, social needs, needs are met. Um, I know I have a hard time expressing my gratitude because um, we've all, like all parents, all people have been in survival mode for several months now, um, especially like working parents and people dealing with like health things and other things like that. It's hard to like take time out to thank everyone that really should be thanked, but I did want to come tonight and just express my gratitude um, to everyone and show our appreciation. And I know I don't speak for every Blue Valley parent, but everyone I personally know feels the same way. We all feel so grateful for the hard work, uncomfortable situations and difficult decisions that you all have had to make and other people have had to enforce um, to make this work. Um, we actually had our daughter choose the virtual option last year and we actually had a lot of negative comments from people about it. Um, that wasn't our experience. We had a positive experience with it and while it wasn't perfect, um, it did what it needed to do to ensure that she needed, it, it served us for what she needed at the time and um, very beneficial for her. And I think that she learned some really long-term life skills that she wouldn't have gotten any other way, probably until she's way older, just self, you know, time management and things like that. And, and I know a lot of us virtual parents felt the same way. We had a lot of anxiety about what this year was going to bring and what that meant for our children that we all made the made a lot of sacrifices to keep them home last year. Um, and all of us were relieved um, to see how things are going this year. Our children are happy, they're healthy, they're in school. We, you know, knock on wood, I haven't, we haven't had to do anything. It's been great. So just really want to show our appreciation for that. And definitely run out uh, short on time. So go quick on these other two. But um, the other thing is I just have a growing concern for people who and I probably have more questions and answers um, that seem very vocal about like what happens in our school board and what happens in our communities that don't actually live here or have students that go to Blue Valley or have had students that go to Blue Valley. So um, just as a, you know, just to bring that up to the board is it's really important that the board represents and listens to parents, educators, and professionals on education. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brad Uretsky. I don't think Brad's here. And Rupal Gupta. Hi, uh, my name is Rupal Gupta. I'm a general pediatrician. I'm here as a private citizen. And um, I've been a resident of Leewood, Kansas now for the past five years. And um, I'm really just so excited to get to be here. I, I work all the time, and it's not often I get to come and just give my thanks to you guys. So I really do appreciate the work that you all do. Um, my kids are 7 and 10, and they attend Mission Trail Elementary School. One day they're going to go to Blue Valley North, and I hope that all of those paras are back um, to help support them. And um, they've really been thrilled to return for in-person education this year. And I'm really just here to say thank you. Thank you for listening to medical professionals and to the wise words of all of the public health officials that we have um, locally and nationally. Thank you for putting together policy and operational procedures in schools that maximize our kids' ability to find community and mentorship with their teachers, to be present with one another, while, and to learn while mitigating the risks of this um, global pandemic. And really, thank you for providing my children with an extraordinary and invigorating educational experience that fosters their inclusion, addresses their educational needs, and keeps them healthy. And you know, as I've as I've been listening to people here today, I I think back to my days as uh, one of the few people of color in my elementary school, which was back east, where I thought nothing. I, I never thought I would live in Kansas one day, and here I am, and I love it. And um, I. Uh, I I would have, you know, back then I had I had teachers who would tell me something different about my history than what I knew. They would tell me different things about my religion and tell me I was wrong because of what I was saying. And it's such, um, it's I never would have expected to see to see the world the way it is today with inclusiveness, with with presenting of history in a balanced way that that tells the that that aims to tell the whole story, you know, um, a, a place where people can be included as they are, and you don't have to feel um, different or apart because of you know what you believe or who you love or or how you identify. Um, so I mean, 
you know, really thank you. Um, thank you also to teachers um, and our principals who, who are uh, now enjoying their homes, thank goodness, um, for expecting the highest of our kids, um, for engaging in tough conversations to make sure that they um, become st uh, citizens of integrity. And amid this worst of times, you've really made um, our family's experience a very rewarding one. I see my kids growing in spirit and mind every day. And um, you know this has been a very tough year and a half, but we're making progress. Um, I, I really want us to continue common sense measures like masking and social distancing um, through which we have prevented widespread outbreaks breaks of COVID-19 and really allowed our kids to move forward. So let's get through this next period, making sure that we retain masking and safety procedures, support our kids, make sure that they get immunized safely against COVID and we continue to collaborate as a community. And I, I really appreciate you all and thank you for enabling the education of our next generation, making this the best time for our family. Thank you. Thank you. As a former New Yorker, I agree with you. I love Kansas as well. So. <laughs> that wraps up our open forum for tonight. On behalf of the Board of Education, I'd like to thank our participants. We appreciate that each of you took the time to share your thoughts with us. Please know that the board and district administration took notes during open forum and we will follow up as needed with participants. Um, next up, we're gonna, oh. Oh, we need, a, we need a break. We have a five minute break that we need to take right now, so.
All right, everyone, we're going to call the meeting to order now. Do I have a motion? Yep. Sorry. I move that the Board of Education approve the agenda for the October 11th regular Board of Education meeting as public. Second. Motion by Stacy. Second by Tom. All those in favor? Oh. Aye. And Amy. Amy is um, on audio. So that's 7 0. Okay, we went both out of order. But, uh, reports from Board of Elections. Yeah. Oh. That's good. I asked you. I know. <laughs> Sorry. Now we'll have reports from You're good. Board Advisory Committees. Right. So I'll start us off with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee met uh, last Thursday on October 7th. Um, we first started out uh, with um, some feedback on our ESSER funds that we are doing with various committees and groups throughout um, that we have in Blue Valley. So the committee did that. And then the second part of the meeting was an update on how um, district uh, the district develops curriculum, so Kelly Ott and Jennifer Luzinski were there. Um, they talked about Board of Education Policies 4000, which articulates how we write curriculum, and 4600, which is how we um, select resources. Um, they also answered questions from the committee. The committee, um, as you could imagine, had questions about how um, equity and diversity is integrated into the curriculum. They also had questions about how our teachers um, go about um, delivering that curriculum in, in a fair and unbiased manner. Uh, it was great um, participation and feedback. The next meeting of this committee is on Thursday, November 4th at 4 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, next up, I think uh, uh, Dr. Collier is going to give the curriculum and instruction. The Curriculum Board Advisory Committee met on September 8th. That evening began with Kelly at reviewing the purpose of the committee. And next, a back to school report was provided to the committee, similar to the report that the Board of Education received at your September Board of Education meeting. Kelly Ott explained the professional strategies that academic services, teachers, and building leaders are emphasizing to ensure learning acceleration as a result of understanding the effects of COVID 19 on student learning and development. These strategies are referred to the core four internally and emphasize the following, culture and climate, professional learning communities, data or formative assessments, and an interventionist mindset. Adam Wade, Director of Academic Achievement and Accountability, reviewed student performance with the committee. He emphasized Acadians data and math data. He will revisit the committee with results for this, uh, from this school year. Our next meeting is October 13th. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Mark Schmidt with the Health and Wellbeing Committee. Good evening. The Health and Wellbeing uh, Committee met on uh, September 20, 22nd via Zoom. The meeting was called to order at 4 p.m. After a welcome and introduction for our first meeting, uh, we discussed the purpose of the committee and talked about the scope, including counseling, social work, health services, parents as teachers, and special education. Next, we talked, we talked to all of the members and asked what they would like to hear about this year, or what they would like to learn more about and participate. Uh, we had a great conversation and some of the topics included mental health supports for staff, nurses, and administrators, hosting a panel discussion to hear the student's perspective on creating healthy school environments, uh, the impact of having greenery within each school, a student perspective on COVID-19 and procedures, supporting students' friends in crisis, and how and whether vaping continues to be an issue or not. You know, some, a lot of things kind of get overshadowed uh, through COVID. It was also suggested that um, we, we take a look and talk about mental health as it relates to the heavy load of AP courses some of our kids are taking in high school. And a couple of suggestions were made that I'm sure we'll be able to bring forward to some other committees as well. Following this discussion, we talked about a COVID-19 update which uh, you all have received several times. 
Uh, but we, we talked about how that response was going, the impact of quarantine, and then what we can do to make sure that students are transitioning uh, safely and also uh, with their well-being in mind. The meeting concluded at 532, and our next meeting is November 3rd at 4 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, Kyle Hayden is going to give two reports, uh, facility and operations and student activities. Good evening. The Finance and Operations Board Advisory Committee met on October 7th via Zoom. Along with, I, along with the board representatives, provided a general district update on a number of items, including the uh, November Board of Education elections, the nearing end of the first quarter, and the continued staffing and supply chain shortages. Director of Accounting and Payroll, Nathan Mole, and Jonathan Nybarger, Vice President with Allen, Gibbs, and Hulick, presented the district's financial statements for last year. A report uh, is going uh, to be presented to the board later this evening. Nathan Mole presented a summary of the district's investments as of September 30th. I provided an update on the use of ESSER COVID federal relief funds, and the committee went through a thought exchange exercise to give us feedback. Director of Finance Jenny, Jenny Daniel presented the bond tax compliance checklist summary for fiscal year 21. That's on the consent agenda for tonight. Jake Slobodnik, Director of Facilities and Operations, and Jason Gillum, Director of Business Operations, presented the monthly bids and contracts. The next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, November 4th. The Student Activities Committee met on September 23rd via Zoom. The primary purpose for the Student Activities Committee meeting was to discuss a focus for this school year. Given that it was the first meeting, the Board of Education representatives for the committee shared the history and the in past initiatives that have, the committee has worked on. The committee then broke into small groups to discuss topics for the committee's consideration. Each small group then shared the discussion topics with the entire group. Administrators provided athletic and activity updates for the high schools and middle schools, followed by an update from the Blue Valley Recreation Commission. The next meeting is scheduled for October 21st. And that concludes our committee reports. Okay. Um, next, we have reports from board members and superintendent from items not included on the agenda. Tom? I have nothing to matter by Okay. Jody? I do have something. Um, I just want to give a, a big shout out to the, our, <clears throat> our bands here in Blue Valley. They are absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. I know everybody in this room understands that, but um, was able to go to the Blue Valley District Marching Showcase a few weeks ago and um, absolutely blown away. Um, so the, the talent that we have in this district and in so many different areas, and, and this includes band, I'm, um, it was absolutely amazing. So just a, a big shout out there. Mike? Just a, a very quick item. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that Steve Basinger, the executive, excuse me, the ex-executive director of Blue Valley Rec retired on September 17th after 13 years. Steve spent 35 years in um, parks and recreation stuff and was um, Blue Valley Rec's longest standing um, executive director. And the first, believe it or not, to retire and not go to another job. So if you get a chance, um, drop Steve a line. I'm sure he has absolutely nothing to do except play golf and pickleball. <laughs> Stacy? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, I had my recaps all written out from all my uh, board advisory committees, but I forgot that we do the wonderful recap, so I don't have to bore you all with that. Uh, suffice it to say, it is a pleasure to sit in on DEI, SAC, health and well-being, um, and uh, hear from our patrons and get the sense that we're worried about normal issues and we're tackling some things. Um, it's starting to feel like things are calming down, that um, we're getting some real work done, um, which is super exciting for me. I love those meetings. I'd love to hear what the patrons have to say. And so thank you for all of you that are involved in that. Um, I also have to give my monthly thank you to our incredible staff. Um, I really feel like I don't say that enough, um, and they are doing a tremendous job with our kids every day. So just a simple thank you um, for that. And then the last thing I would just suggest um, that everyone uh, don't forget to vote uh, next month. We have um, important elections coming up, and it's not just the Board of Education, which obviously I'm super um, interested in, but there's city council races, mayor races, uh, JCCC. Um, so anyway, um, 
just pay attention to that and make sure you take the opportunity to get out and vote thank you and i believe early voting starts october twenty third at hilltop is one of the locations so patrick okay i will go um i have a couple things um first uh homecomings it's so fun to see normal um my son's a sophomore and so they didn't really have homecoming last year and so essentially he was like a freshman at homecoming so it was just so exciting to see them get to live through some normal high school memories and um, that light at the end of the tunnel is there by all of these normal activities that we're starting to um, see take place so and i think i know we have southwest this coming weekend um, and the rest of them have already taken place did all of them take place outside no west didn't okay but all they all went so well i've heard nothing but terrific things and so it's just it's great to hear that kind of stuff um i also want to say congratulations we had a record number of national merit semi-finalists 58 of our students in blue valley and that's always very exciting um, that is a huge honor um, and a very difficult feat to uh, to achieve so um we look forward to seeing their successes. Um, I also wanted to just say on um, October 28th, I believe, I am attending the KA, oh no, it's not October 28th. Well, anyway, in the next couple weeks, I'm attending the KASB, um, well, I have a high school task force, the graduation requirement task force that I'm still on. We've had two more meetings since my last time um, we've broken into subgroups to try and uh, pin down some ideas so that we can get something on paper to have um, more conversations with the community. And there will be things coming out to get public feedback. We want all stakeholders to have a say in what these changes may or may not look like for our Kansas graduation requirements. Um, so stay tuned with that. Um, and then I will also attend the KSB Legislative Assembly meeting at the at KSB convention, which is November 7th, I believe. Um, so I'll be doing that. And that is it. I have a couple, I have a couple of things too. Um, first of all, this is National Physical Therapy Month and we do have some physical therapists uh, within our district. So we want to uh, shout out to those individuals who provide um, great services for our students. Uh, next, next week is also National School Bus Safety Week, and one of the days is School Bus Driver Day. Uh, but you know, we have a great partnership with Durham. We've had some challenges, just like every other um, entity across the United States, finding bus drivers. Um, but, but we really value and cherish the bus drivers that we have. They're the, the first, first thing that many of our um, students see in the morning, the first person, and they provide really positive experiences. So thank you to Durham and to our bus drivers for all that they do. Um, as Michelle mentioned, we have 58 National Merit semifinalists. That began last October when they took the PSAT. And that begins this Wednesday for the current junior class. So this Wednesday is a national testing day for PSAT. So all across the country, that is when the PSAT is given. It is a testing day in Blue Valley. So our high school students will be testing for the most part, either doing a PSAT or a practice ACT. Um, and then uh, they will be have an early release on Wednesday for high school only. Um, but I just wanted to give a shout out and to tell our high school students good luck and that we're thinking of them. They're ready for this and um, I, it'll be a, a good day for them. I also want to say kudos to our high school teachers and administrators for homecoming activities. I think that many of them have started some new traditions, which is pretty exciting. Also want to thank our elementary and middle schools who have done activities as well from carnivals and outdoor activities to plays and as sports at middle school. Um, plays are just getting started as well. I'm, I'm pretty excited this Saturday. I'm going to Clue at Blue Valley North, um, so I can report on that next month. Um, we also, um, this is the end of the first quarter, Friday. Um, Friday is a, a no school or no student a contact day. We have our teachers involved in professional learning and wrapping up the first quarter. But we would be remiss if we didn't thank um, our entire community, our students, our parents, our teachers, our administrators, our librarians, our paras, our nurses, 
every single person who is in our schools because we have had a very successful first quarter and it's because we have all worked together on that. I'm getting ready to hit every one of our buildings, 38 buildings, between tomorrow and December 15th. So um, I am very excited that, uh, you know, Mr. Mitchell, you always ask me if I get to do my normal job. That is my normal job, and I am pretty excited to start that uh, little tour tomorrow and see the great things firsthand that are happening within our building. Okay. Now we now. Now. Yeah, why don't you do it again, just okay. in case. All right. So um, I move that the Board of Education approve the agenda for the October 11th regular Board of Education meeting as published. Second. All right. Motion by Stacy. Oh, everyone. Oh, all those. Motion by Stacy. I'm sorry. Second by Tom. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Or say aye. aye. Or say aye. Thank you. Uh, that's 7-0. Okay. Next, we have to approve the consent agenda. I move that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda for the October 11th regular Board of Education meeting as published. Second. Motion by Tom, uh, second by Jody. All those in favor, raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. Okay, that passes 7-0. Um, next, we have new business, okay. Uh, we have our annual audit report for 2021. This is exciting stuff, guys. So making the way to the podium is Nathan, who's going to start us off. Nathan, you don't have to take that. Hey, that was not facetious. I was an auditor in my previous life, so uh -huh. I was. You can look it up. I worked for Price Waterhouse no in problem. New York City. So... And then I became a teacher because yep. that wasn't for me, but it's still <laughs> exciting. So thank you. Well, good evening. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, Jonathan Nyberger with um, Alan Gibbs and Hulick. Um, but I did want to take a quick second um, in the spirit of tonight kind of being a lot about appreciation. I wanted to acknowledge all the hard work of our um, finance and operations team, but especially specifically the accounting, payroll and budgeting team over the last three months have worked very closely with our auditors, helping getting them the documents and information they need to complete their audits. So I just wanted to acknowledge our teams for all their hard work. So I'll let Jonathan speak to the audit report. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, good evening, I'm Jonathan Nybarger and was the officer in charge of the 2021 audit this year. I'll briefly go through the audit and the financial statements and then answer any questions you may have. Um, in front of you, I believe you should have a financial statement um, that also has a couple loose pages. Um, I'm first gonna go through the financial statements and then address the um, other letters that are included. In the financial statements, pages one and two are the auditor's report. The auditor's report includes standards that we use for the audit and most importantly, the opinion that we issued. The opinion can be found on the second page in the first paragraph. We issued an unmodified opinion, which is the highest and best opinion the district can receive. And I feel like that speaks very highly on the financial management of the school district. Also in the um, auditor's report, right below our opinion was an emphasis of matter paragraph. Um, that was due to a couple of items that are included in the district's financial statements this year. The first was the district's required implementation of Governmental Accounting Standards Board um, number 84 fiduciary activities. The implementation of this standard replaced uh, agency funds that were previously reported in the district's financial statements and required the district to evaluate those funds um, on how they should be classified going forward under the new standards requirements. As a part of um, this evaluation, the district also evaluated other funds and reclassified some of their existing funds as well. So as such, in the financial statements, you'll see now a combining general fund schedule um, that includes several funds that qualified as general funds, um, as well as some reclassification of those agency funds to um, non-major special revenue funds as well. Uh, other than this reorganization to the district's financial statements, there were no major changes to the district's financial statements um, from past years. The other part that I wanted to point out was towards the end of the financial statements, um, and 
is the um, kind of last section of the audit, and it's it, regarding the um, schedule of expenditures of federal awards. Because the district expended more than $750,000 in federal expenditures during the year, you're required to receive a special audit of, over those um, expenses. This year, we audited the elementary school, um, or, or, sorry, elementary and secondary school emergency relief grant, the trial nutrition cluster grants, and the coronavirus relief fund grant uh, that came through the county. And I'm happy to report as part of our audits uh, of all of these grants, we did not have any findings that we noted. So then separate from the financial statements, um, it, it, we issued our governance letter, which is our letter to all of you to keep you informed about significant matters of the audit. Um, towards the bottom of the first page, there's, um, it notes the adoption of the GASB 84 by the district, um, which I already talked about relating to our emphasis of matter paragraph. Um, on the second page, it discusses some of the significant estimates that the district includes as part of um, their financial statements, which are the net pension liability, allowances on receivables, compensated absences, and other post-employment benefit liabilities. And then we also noted that we um, did not are not aware of any uncorrected misstatements uh, in the district's financial statements. So in conclusion, I would like to thank um, all of the district staff that we work with this year. Uh, I always like to mention that an audit is a huge undertaking for all district staff um, that we work with. And so we appreciate all their help and it seems like they do a great job for the district. So thank you for your time this evening and I'm available for any questions you may have. I know I asked that. How many years have you done this for us? You, you were with the previous firm. I, I, I was yeah. with the previous audit firm. Okay. Um, so at AGH, we've had this audit now um, for two years. Okay. Um, I, I left for an in-between year. And then um, over the course of being there for about 11 years, I, I've worked on the audit probably a decent portion of those years. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your work. Thank you. And it is a huge undertaking for our staff. Um, I know that when the auditors come, sometimes the staff are a little like, oh gosh, now there's, we have to pull documents and, but um, your work is very appreciated as well. So thank you very much. And I'm sure our staff was very nice to you because that's why I wasn't into the whole audit thing. My, the staff were not very pleased when, I, when an auditor would walk in. So I didn't like that. All right, thank you. All right, next um, we will have the COVID prevention update. All right, uh, Dr. Schmidt is going to lead us through this discussion um, around the mitigation measures that we have in place, as well as our dashboard numbers. Uh, as we've been doing at the previous monthly meetings, uh, we're starting off with just a look at what our COVID data looks like. Um, I'm very pleased to report to the board and also to our community that our numbers have continued to drop off. Uh, just even this last week, our numbers were cut in half from 32 cases down to 16. I think this is a good time just to stop and, and recognize all the work that is going on throughout the district. It's our principals, our nurses, our teachers, everybody that has a hand in making sure that the prevention method, uh, methodology is followed uh, I think it's really showing and it, it's paying dividends to our community. And where you really see that is in all the activities that were talked about earlier tonight. Um, in, a, in addition to this positive news, as, as you might expect, our quarantine data has also dropped. That's improved. So we're down, uh, this last time we had 70 students that were quarantined at some point during this last week. Um, we've talked multiple times about how do we get kids keep kids in school, and then also return them to school as quickly as possible. That is truly our goal. And while the uh, recognizing who has COVID and then also doing some quarantines is part of those efforts, we want to figure out how do we get kids back quicker. And part of that can be uh, testing strategies that have been put forward by the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and also KSDE. Uh, the first area way of testing that helps prevent the spread is our teachers have an opportunity every Thursday to voluntarily uh, test and to see whether or not you know that 
just to see if they are asymptomatic and also positive. As you can see, for three consecutive weeks, uh, we, we had two total cases that were positive. And so that was very, very good news. On October 7th, we started something new, a driving clinic that we'll talk about here in a minute, and all numbers were combined. In addition, we wanted to make sure that our staff members had an opportunity in order to see if the sniffles they have are related to the common cold, allergies, or COVID. And so we started a new system, and, and Eric Punswick, Dr. Punswick, uh, was a major driving force in getting this up and going through a partnership with MOD. Right now, you can drop off, uh, staff can pick up a kit, uh, utilize the kit, drop off a specimen at two different locations, one very close to district office and another one over at the MOD headquarters. And within 12 to 16 hours, they will have their results. And so that allows people to safely come to school or, or come to work and provide services to our kids. Something brand new since the last month is we also started a driving clinic with MOD. MOD, MOD is sponsoring it. We are providing space. Um, this driving clinic is modeled after one that was opened up over at Shawnee Mission to start with, and I believe they are expanding it to other districts as well. But it operates Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 3.30. It's open to any student or student's immediate family member or staff member or their immediate family member. So we wanted to make sure that, that not only are our employees safe and their families safe, but our kids and their families as well. And all you need to do is call, make an appointment, and they will get you in. Uh, very soon, we should be able to do those scheduling online that will make the process even work quicker. The test results are emailed to the parents and also our, our employee and then also to our wellness team within 12 to 16 hours. In the first week, or in the first week, we had 153 tests given with two positives. Keep in mind, that's without advertising. Uh, we finally sent out a parent notice uh, right at the end of the week because we wanted to have a kind of a slow start to make sure we were set, ready to go. Coming soon, this is where we get back to school quicker. Um, the Kansas Health Department and, and Kansas Department of Education have really been talking to us about a testing strategy of uh, test to stay and learn. And what this would do is allow our students who might have been exposed, been a close contact uh, to a positive case of COVID to, by doing daily testing, they would be able to come back to school and to benefit from their education during that time that they would otherwise be quarantined at home. And the health department, uh, I've got the seal of approval from Johnson County Health Department that this is safe. Uh, it, it, it virtually eliminates the, the need to, to do, um, to go back and remove somebody. I mean, they're not gonna be positive because we're also using the state of the art uh, PCR testing. And so that's going to be a very positive addition, I believe, to our district. Now, you'll notice that it says November 1st is our start date. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because it's very timely and students would need to go to the clinic after school and then get the results before school the next day, Ma uh, Mod, Mod Labs needs to increase the number of staff members that they have uh, working in the lab to make sure to process all of those tests. And then secondly, in order to expand the hours of our driving clinic. And as you can see, our new hours at the driving clinic starting November 1st uh, would be 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. That gives uh, several hours after school in order to get in for testing. Friday would, would end at 3.30 because we don't have school Saturday. And then on Sunday, we'll have 10 to 2 o'clock uh, testing available. Everything else is the same. Um, I would welcome your questions, our discussion. I have a quick question. Um, so can you take me through a little bit, let's say my student has been exposed, okay. just quick little synopsis of, of how this te uh, test to stay thing works. So uh, let, let's say that if your child is exposed at school, what will happen is uh, the school district will share that information with Johnson County Health Department. Uh, the health department will then respond back and, and let us know uh, whether or not the student needs to be quarantined and excluded from school. 
Uh, we share that information with the parents. We have the student go home. Uh, if the parents would choose, and it is a choice, to participate in this return to or uh, test to stay and learn, then what they would do is they go to the driving clinic or really to any any lab that that has the PCR testing, and give us you know give their specimen and it would be tested. And as long as they had it did not detect virus, which is a negative result, they would be allowed to come to school the next day. They would do that each day uh, during that seven day period. And if all is, is good, if there's not a positive result, they would not have to miss any school whatsoever. What, uh, what happens if, if on day four, um, my kiddo it comes back as a positive? What do you do? Well, in that case, the student, because any, any student that's positive with a communicable disease would need to be excluded, just like, you know, you're sick. Um, we did talk to the health department whether we would need to go back two days or not, like we do currently, and they said no, because it would be only that short time period between when the test was given and then when the new positive was given. So they'll be, uh, we'll report that information, we'll still report to the health department uh, the information that they request, which might include did the student, need, you know, was the student unmasked with any other students, but it should, we really expect that not to have uh, much impact at all as far as the spread goes, or not, no impact based so, on what the Johnson County said. Dr. Schmidt, a couple of clarifications. One is um, if a student has been exposed and they're participating in this um, test to stay, uh, lunch, we would have to make um, exceptions for them. Am I correct? That they would they would have to sit. Um, yes. We would have to provide a space for them where they're not within six feet of somebody else, because our expectation would be that they would be masked uh, the entire time they were within six feet of anybody else. Yes, I apologize for glossing over that. There are some additional safety measures. Uh, students would have to be masked. Um, uh, in order to be in the building, and then also our, our principals will work with them to have a safe place to have a distanced lunch. Other Anyone, questions? Other questions for Dr. Schmidt? Um, well, one back in August, we had um, our conversation about masks in schools, and we said that we would review this quarterly, at least, and um, so uh, I entertain a discussion uh, or continued questions for Dr. Schmidt or Dr. Merrigan about how things are going with the masks and um, any enlightenment as to when maybe we can change course. <laughs> so um, I will just start by saying that um, I've been very pleased with the numbers that we've seen. Um, it's obvious that this is keeping kids in their seats in school, and that is the number one objective right now. Um, I do still worry, though, that there's no end game, and I am curious your thoughts on how Joko Health is feeling about our community numbers coming down, and if there's been any inkling as to when there is a true light at the end of the tunnel. Um, well, I would love to say that I have you know, an exact number or I, when, I, things, no, you when don't. things come, just... but I do not. Um, I would say that there's a couple of factors that are still uh, that are still on hold. I think, you know, vaccinations have not started yet for uh, students that are five, you know, five to 11, and then also vaccination of their younger siblings, you know, that, that might still be in early childhood or not. I don't know if that would be something they're holding out for or not. But we still have a sizable chunk of our population that, that has not had the opportunity to be vaccinated. Um, I imagine that's one of the steps. I, I would also ex expect that they would want to see um, a lower level, you know, the low level of spread, just kind of what we've been seeing. I, I would say they're very encouraged about what they're seeing across the community uh, overall. There still have been some hot spots. Mm -hmm. uh, within Johnson County that, that they've expressed concern over, uh, but they've tried to address that as quickly as possible. Um, I agree with you that at some point we'll need to have uh, kind of an end game of, okay, when, when does this make sense from a health and well, wellness stance to, 
to move to the next step. Um, we're making some great strides towards normalcy, but I, I also know that we have a lot of community members that would like to see that go another step or two. Right. Um, Dr. Holshi, when she was here, mm -hmm. I asked her at that time if this were our numbers in late May, early June, would we be having this conversation about masking? And she, I, if I heard her correctly, she said probably not. Like they were, yeah. uh, they were thinking things were going really well and we were on our way to having a normal school year. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if it's worth it to have her come back maybe in a month or two or next month or I, I don't know what anyone is open to, but as the numbers do in, improve, um, I think it would make our community feel better to hear someone from the health department maybe kind of give the we're getting their thumbs up kind of thing. That's my thinking um, because I, I want the masks to go away. We can absolutely invite yeah. Dr. Holshi back. Okay. Um, but I also understand that we are trying to keep kids in school and kids aren't vaccinated yet. I think they're saying November 1st no, is the November, possible yeah. target date. So November's we'll a big day. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see if that happens, but hopefully it will. Does anyone else have any comments or questions or discussion? Well, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I think, you know, at least personally, um, and from what I'm hearing, is you know nobody likes this, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's <laughs> I, I don't see many people now. You know, I, it it was nice today when it was chilly out. I didn't have to wear a scarf because you know my face was covered. But but nobody really likes this. So um, I just want to make for sure that, and I love this concept. And I know you guys have really worked hard on this test to stay and learn. I think this is adding another level to keep the goal of keeping kids in seats, and keeping face-to-face -face learning going. And, and I absolutely love this next step. And it's, it, it, to me, this is the right step to take right now. Um, and uh, you know, so we can kind of continue to work you know, down this road. Does anybody know when this will end? We don't know. Nobody, nobody knows you know, how this is gonna work. We've, coming into winter months, people are gonna be outside less maybe. I, you know, who knows? But uh, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into thinking kind of, I want to say outside of the box a little bit um, and, and doing something a little bit farther than what maybe your normal job would, would normally entail. And, and so I think this test to stay and learn program is a, is a great concept um, to be able to implement. I, I think it also, you know, I was praising earlier internal staff. I think Johnson County Health Department and also the Kansas Health Department. This is really done in collaboration with them and with their blessing, you know, from a public health perspective. So that gives me a lot more confidence about moving forward with this. And as we head into winter months and people start, I mean, there's already been a fall funk cold going around amongst yep. people that was not COVID. Um, and so this testing, even just for the teachers every Thursday or any time with the drive up clinic for any immediate family of students or teachers that will really help people feel more confident okay this is something that i need to stay home for or this is just the normal cold that we get every year um, and that that really is my biggest i hate the masks yes everybody hates the masks but we do we do want to know that there is some sort of plan for when this is going to be um, back to normal um, we always got colds, we always got sick, and we didn't cancel school or make people stay home. And so we need to get back to that point at some point. But no, I mean like a cold. I mean, it's not saying oh, yeah, sick, so. sick. No, the I don't flu. mean, if you have a fever or the flu, of course not. But I'm just saying, you know, if you have the sniffles, I don't want to be freaking out that I have COVID. Well, the testing will help with that. Um, and at some point we need to feel like we're making a shift somewhere. Um, so we're headed there. I don't think, me personally, that I'm ready to say, ta-da, we're done at this point at all. And I think most of you maybe feel the same way. Yeah, Michelle, I would concur with what you and Jody have both said. I, I'm not, I, I feel right now like we've got a really good mitigation strategy in place, um, and I'm not ready to mess with it yet. I would love to have Elizabeth Holshue come back and uh, speak to us. I'm not sure when the timing is on that. Um, but you know, before we would make any change in decisions on how we're operating, 
I would really look to have somebody from uh, the county come to speak to us and provide some support and guidance for you know when is uh, a safe time to make that transition. Um, and um, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. Thank you. Anyone, um, Amy, does, do you have anything you wanna add or ask Dr. Schmidt? <laughs> No, I don't think I have anything additional. I would uh, be supportive, like Stacy said. Okay. So since we're not changing anything, we don't have to vote on anything, or we're just going to keep it the same for now. Um, we will and, invite uh, somebody from the health department to come in in November and and have that discussion. November eighth, I think, is when we meet, and that that's would be probably great. a good time. Yeah, I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank I, you. And I think that would make our community feel better hearing from what their thoughts are so all right what's next next we have a review of policy 4600 and 4610 so um my it guys over there if you guys want to pull up policy 4600 that would be great um, so on the screen now is Board of Education Policy 4600. Um, this has been around uh, for quite a while. And this is, um, you know, routinely we uh, review policies. We're not um, proposing any change to the policy, but I thought it was important um, for, for us to spend a little bit of time talking about it and for the community to um, understand that there is policy around the selection of our learning resources. Okay. So policy 4600, um, those of us in the, who have worked in curriculum know this well. Um, this talks about how we go about selecting quality learning resources for our students. Um, this would include uh, textbooks, but it also includes library acquisitions, um, ancillary materials that, that are used in the classroom, any other resources used for formal or informal teaching. So it includes not only the large textbook adoptions that we do, um, where we adopt a, a new math series or a new um, reading series, but it also would include um, those things that a teacher uh, would choose to use um, in addition to maybe some of the um, core materials that we have done. There are talks here about how you go about doing that. So first of all, it has to tie to the curriculum. We have another policy that talks about how you write that curriculum. So any resource that a teacher uses um, or that the district purchases has to tie to the curriculum. It also talks about the quality of the resource, looking at favorable reviews, um, uh, looking at making sure it's a reputable source, uh, making sure that you have a, a number of um, different voices and, and representation within there. Uh, and then it talks about a, a conflict of interest. So um, those are all the, the, the different things that go into the selection of a resource. Um, our policies are, are on our district website. That's the other thing that I would say um, for um, anybody who's at home looking. The other policy that we have here is policy 4610. 4610 talks about the challenges to those learning resources. So, you know, we, we do have this policy that talks about how you select a learning resource, anything from a large textbook series to a library book to an online subscription to a, um, just a, a poem maybe that a, a teacher uses in their classroom. And there, I believe that we have people who do great work and, and to follow that policy. But what this does is that it allows, um, if a mistake has been made, um, that it allows us to self-correct. And so that's what this talks about, is there's a well-defined board-approved process um, if there's something that somebody within the community, um, whether it's a staff member, whether it's a parent, or honestly, whether it's a student, um, who feels that we have erred in some way on a resource that we have selected, it walks you through the process of how you would challenge that. There are two types of individuals with this policy, a directly affected person and an indirectly affected person, and it defines out what those are. It defines out what a learning resource is. Um, there are multiple levels that involve um, committees. At a starts at a building level, uh, then it can be appealed to a district level, a level, and then finally to the Board of Education. Um, on those committees are staff members, librarians, but also on those committees are parents, and at the high school level, there would be students involved. 
Um, so th there is a well-defined process, uh, and I, I have followed this process. It has been a while um, since I had to lead one of these, but um, have been a part of this process. And it's a um, very good process. It's uh, very thorough. Uh, it involves um, really, um, I, I believe, all aspects of our community as we go through this. So um, in addition to this, there are also guidelines um, to all of these policies, which also can be found online. There's, there's links right there, very easy to find. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about those two um, policies. And I'm open to questions or anything the board would like to talk about. Um, quick question. So how long does that process take? Approximately. Well, it, it depends on what the what it is that you're reviewing. For example, if you are reviewing a library book or a novel of some sort, you have to give a committee time to read that novel. So you have to you have to find the people first of all. Uh, you have to give them time to read the novel because that would be the expectation of the committee is that you read the entire um, resource. Or if it's a online subscription that you spend multiple much time you know going through all of those different resources. Uh, but no more than 30 days is what we say. Uh, but we would try and do that in a shorter amount of time. But we would want to make sure we gave people time to um, thoroughly go through the resource. Okay. Thank you. And then can we just clarify that is for any type of material in any building? I mean, it could be a library book. It could be a poem that's quoted in class time. It could be a magazine that's you know available for kids to read. So it, it's anything is open for review by you know the you know definition of the policy by the affected individuals to submit. Or I mean we're not just talking about you know curriculum books in the classroom that are being taught class wide by the teacher. Is that true? Yeah, uh, I'm reading exactly how we define it here in the sorry in the policy. Learning resources are defined as textbooks, library acquisitions, and ancillary materials for classroom use, and any other resources used for formal or informal teaching and learning purposes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? All right. Um, I think next we have to appoint um, patrons to board advisory committees. I believe we have one. I move that the Board of Education appoints Luke Samuel of the Northeast District to a new two-year term on the Student Activities Board Advisory Committee as a Blue Valley High School representative. Second. Okay, motion by Tom, second by Stacy. All those in favor, raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. Okay, that passes 7-0. And I believe that that is, motion to yeah, adjourn. so we need a motion to adjourn. I move that the October 11 regular Board of Education meeting be adjourned. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Stacy. All those in favor, raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. All right, that passes 7-0. Thank you, guys. Happy birthday, Kyle Hayden, Michelle Benjamin, Corey Moan. We have a few birthdays here, Michelle. Oh, yeah. Michelle's telling me. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, they aren't as fun anymore.